so many cars claim to be unique, but the Range Rover really is, continuing to set the standard in the super luxury SUV sector. Launched in 2012, then substantially improved in 2018 to create the model we're going to look at here, this aluminium bodied fourth generation version offers the option of plug-in hybrid power and in all its guises claims to be able to properly combine the imperious qualities of a top luxury saloon with off-piste abilities that would be limited only by the skills of its driver. A Rolls Royce in the rough, there's nothing quite like it. Sometimes being the best just isn't good enough. Take the Range Rover, with a pedigree over four distinct generations going all the way back to 1970. It's always been, without question, the finest 4x4 by far, yet the challenges remain. How to remain the world's leading luxury SUV while appearing credibly eco-centric? How to make further forays into the market for super luxury saloons against rivals that don't have to be able to cross the Congo or see you through Siberia? And how to reach out to a whole new group of buyers from both segments who would never previously have considered a Range Rover? Well, this improved fourth generation model has to do all this and much more. An extreme challenge, certainly, but then this car is well used to those. Over the decades, we've driven them all over the world, from Icelandic glaciers to the Australian wilderness, from up in the Colorado Rockies to downtown in Beverly Hills. But even we were wondering how on earth the brand might meet the fresh and testing demands of a very different era. This L405 Series Mark IV model, first launched back in 2012, has offered an insight into how the Solihull maker plans to reinterpret the Range Rover formula for a fresh generation of buyers and deal with those challenges. Like the 70s original, it's clearly revolutionary and for very much the same reason. A lightweight aluminium body structure set Spencer King's very first Range Rover apart nearly half a century ago. And this plutocratic SUV model's adoption of much the same thing gives this car a credible shot at all its stated goals. The lighter body weight means that it can be larger, faster and more responsive at the same time as being more efficient, cheaper to run and better equipped. All of this is important in justifying this car's super luxury SUV status, which positions it a cut above the ordinary large luxury 4x4s that Sony held targets with its lesser Range Rover Sport. The Range Rover pioneered this rarefied segment, but it no longer has it to itself, following fresh arrivals in recent years from Bentley, Lamborghini and Mercedes. In response, Land Rover significantly updated this iconic model for the 2018 year with an all new interior, extra safety and infotainment technology, and perhaps most importantly, the option of the plug-in petrol electric powertrain that we're gonna test here. As a result, this flagship Range Rover model line can claim a lighter eco footprint, a properly limousine-like rear cabin, and performance that, with the right engineering package, can even approach that of a super saloon. And yes, it'll be even better if you're setting off across the Serengeti or you're exploring the Amazon. It'll be more than ever one of a kind, as we're just about to discover. Everything changed for this model line with the introduction of this fourth generation Range Rover and much has changed since, yet in many ways nothing is different. Step up into the famous command driving position and you find yourself sitting throne-like in a beautifully appointed cabin that positions you around 90mm higher than you would be in other premium SUVs. It's a place from which you look out across the hedgerows and to life beyond the urban sprawl. There's just nothing quite like it. Push the start button and the rotary gear selector glides up into the palm of your hand, twist it to drive and the car simply glides away. Once on the move, luxury, comfort, refinement, craftsmanship and outright performance all fuse together as part of this car's imperious progress, whether that be on turf or on tarmac. 
All the available powertrains offer exemplary refinement, but should you select one that adds in electrified assistance, then as you might imagine, this car is particularly quiet. Now referring here to the petrol electric hybrid engine used in the P400E variant we've chosen to test today. Never fear, if you don't feel the need to make some sort of corporate responsibility statement, then more conventional six and eight cylinder petrol and diesel power plants are still available. But we were intrigued by the thought of a PHEV Range Rover, a variant with just four cylinders, but a combined power output of 404 horsepower, a claimed all-electric driving range of 31 miles, and an official fuel consumption figure better than a Toyota Prius. It's hard not to be, isn't it? This fourth generation model line uh, did feature the option of hybrid technology earlier in its life, but in that case, the electric motor it used was connected to a thirsty V6 diesel, and it had no plug-in capability. It was a variant that almost nobody bought. This P400e petrol electric plug-in package, in contrast, is much more in tune with the current zeitgeist and it'll serve Land Rover far better in key markets like China, the US and the Far East, where diesel is a dirty word. It employs the 300 horsepower version of Jaguar Land Rover's familiar 2-litre Ingenium petrol engine, working in concert with an 85 kilowatt electric motor powered by a 13.1 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery. Yes, as previously mentioned, it is a four-cylinder powertrain, but if fellow Range Rover owners scoff at that, you might want to remind them that this supposedly eco-minded variant develops a 640 newton metre torque figure that outstrips the base version of a supercharged 5-litre petrol V8. 60 from rest is dispatched in just 6.4 seconds, that's even quicker than the V8 diesel, and top speed is higher than you get from the black pump fuel model 2 at 137 miles an hour. All of that should provide sufficient reassurance, uh, should you need it, that in choosing this P400e model, you're not being fobbed off with an engine more suited to an Evoque, which is just as well, given that this particular derivative weighs over two and a half tons, over 300 kilos more than the base TDV6 diesel version. You do notice that under hard acceleration when the little Ingenium unit's downmarket four-cylinder blare is uh, somewhat apparent, but fortunately the acceleration is so rapid that you only have to put up with it for a few seconds before normal library quiet service is resumed, all of which assumes uh, that you're not taking up the option this powertrain offers of all-electric progress. Now, you probably won't be. The quoted 31-mile battery-powered driving range is, well, it's got no basis naturally reality and if you switch from the default parallel hybrid mode to the provided battery only EV setting which guarantees milk float mobility uh, you could find the fossil fueled power source seamlessly cutting in not long after you've crested a twin figure mileage range unless you happen to be driving like Miss Marple of course it's better to use the provided save option to keep any available battery charge for the urban motoring which will allow you to use it more effectively if you're interested the P400E's all-electric top speed is 85 miles an hour. If you don't habitually use your Range Rover around town or for shorter trips, then to be quite frank, you're probably far better off choosing one of the conventional diesels. Now, as previously mentioned, uh, there are two, the six-cylinder 3-litre TDV6 with 258 horsepower and the eight-cylinder 4.4-litre SDV8 with 339 horsepower. Both get from rest to 60 in around seven seconds and they top out at an irrelevant top speed of 130 miles an hour or just over. While you choose your turn, 3-litre V6, 340 horsepower supercharged petrol engine, which goes no faster and is around 50% dirtier and less economical, uh, we really can't quite imagine. As usual, for those who really want to boost their fuel station nectar points tally, there's a 5-litre supercharged petrol V8 at the top of the range. Its output's now boosted to 525 horsepower in standard or 565 horsepower if you go from the top SV autobiography models. Now here, uh, 60 miles an hour from rest flashes by in just 5.1 seconds on route to a top speed that could be as high as 155 miles an hour. Speed, of course, is one thing, control is another. Now, previous Range Rovers have conquered the toughest terrain known on this planet, but they've never fully mastered the rather difficult art of making something that weighs as much as two family cars corner on tarmac in a way that could be described as enjoyable. Is this one different? Well, 
It doesn't have to be, given that Land Rover can, of course, offer moneyed buyers in this segment a Range Rover Sport model designed with much more of a dynamic focus. Despite that, though, clearly a great deal of work has gone into making the handling of this car much closer to the sort of thing you get from a comparably priced boardroom level luxury saloon. All the V8 variants feature a dynamic response, active lean control system, and on the hybrids and the petrol V8s, you can specify an active rear locking differential to optimize tarmac cornering traction and stability. With features like these in place, cornering speeds that would either have completely confounded previous generation models or would have had their occupants reaching for the nearest sick bag are uh, completed without passenger comment. Combine this with the great view out that you get from this commanding driving position and you'll be amazed at just how easy it is to thread this five metre long, uh, two metre wide luxury conveyance down a narrow British country lane. Some cars of this size feel too big for that kind of route. This one doesn't. Which means that when you're not driving in your wellies, but instead you're in the mood and you want to click the eight-speed gearbox's rotary controller to S and flick about with the wheel-mounted change paddles, this car can be a surprisingly enjoyable secondary road companion. That's assuming you switch via this a little rotary controller into the sharpest of the provided tarmac-orientated drive modes, Dynamic. Uh, the other two are Eco and Comfort. Now, with all those settings, the air suspension system helps to keep things on an even keel and that's particularly on off camber roads that dip and crest showing off this car's generous maximum wheel travel and its other standard feature the adaptive dynamic system now this offers continuously adaptive dampers variable through an almost infinite range of settings between soft and hard extremes uh, the system will even sense off-road conditions and optimize damping accordingly Ah yes, off-road conditions. You'll be wanting to know how this car deals with those, of course. Now the Range Rover has long been a master when it comes to getting its occupants across their chosen terrain with consummate assurance and comfort. As has long been the case with this car, there's a full-time intelligent four-wheel drive system with a two-speed transfer box, which you can downshift into on the move up to 37 miles an hour, uh, providing a low range option for difficult conditions or for when towing. The cleverest aspect of this car, though, remains its terrain response off-road driving system and that's selectable via this little driving mode controller that we just referred to at the base of the centre stack. Using this you simply select the setting for the terrain you're covering, sand perhaps for those days at the beach, mud ruts uh, should get you across your local ploughed field and grass gravel snow will be perfect for visiting your folks in the country during the next frosty snap. Avoid entry level trim in the range and your uh, Range Rover will come complete with the Terrain Response 2 version of this setup and that adds an extra rock crawl program for the, well, rather unlikely event that you'll find yourself tackling boulder strewn riverbeds and more usefully an auto setting which will make all the appropriate mode selections for you even advising should there be a need to switch into low range or raise the suspension up to its highest off-road setting in other words all you really need to do is to select auto crank up the stereo and glide over terrain that you wouldn't even walk across it's absolutely brilliant Further helping here is the clever all-terrain progress control system. This is essentially a kind of low-speed cruise control that helps you to maintain steady progress in extreme off-road conditions. And there's Land Rover's unique low traction launch setup, which helps to exploit all the available grip when you're pulling away on slippery surfaces. And that's via a special throttle map that provides a more usable torque curve. It works up to 90 miles an hour too, so it can be used to negotiate slippery surfaces on inclines when the vehicle's moving. Really gnarly rock-strewn terrain can be tackled with total peace of mind thanks to the option available to increase the air suspension's ride height via two bespoke options. Uh, the off-road ride height one setting lifts the vehicle by as much as 40 millimeters, up to 50 miles an hour, and that's ideal for faster driving in less extreme off-road conditions like uh, deeply rutted dirt roads. For more extreme landscapes or when fording rivers, the off-road height two setting takes the car up to 75 millimeters over its usual ride 
ride height at speeds of up to 31 miles an hour. With that selection activated, your Range Rover will be sitting 303 millimeters off the deck and it could wade through up to 900 millimeters of water. And you can monitor the depth using an optional wade sensing feature. And yes, even in this electrified hybrid model, which is just as capable off-road as any other variant. Who says water and electricity don't mix? Now in that highest suspension setting, uh, there's a potential approach angle of 34.7 degrees, a possible departure angle of 29.6 degrees, and for the very brave, a theoretical ramp breakover angle of 28.3 degrees. Otherwise, things are almost exactly as they've always been in a Range Rover. For those who are brave enough to subject such an expensive vehicle to life beyond the paved highway. So there's hill start assist to stop you lurching backwards on a slope as your foot moves from brake to throttle. And gradient acceleration control uh, to automatically maintain a safe and dignified progress down steep hills. Even if you forget to activate the hill descent control system. And there's also a gradient release control function for the hill descent control system that will lower this car over precipitous descents in a careful fashion that passengers will appreciate. No other vehicle takes this much pride in going where it probably shouldn't. This is every inch a Range Rover. You know it as such, even without a glance at the elegant badge work, which is exactly as it should be. Jerry McGovern's design team committed early on to protect the visual characteristics that have always made this car what it is. Uh, the wraparound clamshell bonnet, the deep glass area, the low waist and the straight side feature line with no wedge or step up inside styling, the close wheel arch cuts and the two piece tailgate. But if much about this car is familiar, then much too about this smoother, more contemporary L405 series design is very different, as it has to be to win over a new generation of customers. There's more rakish lean to the front A pillar than previous generation models had, and this, like the B and C pillars further back, has a premium gloss black finish. It's there to emphasize the so-called floating roof that sits above the uh, near flush side glazing. And that can on request be contrast colored in black or silver. The side fender graphics on the front doors, they also look neat and the wheels are predictably huge. They vary in size between 19 and 22 inches. We've got the 21 inch rims here. And buyers get a choice of this short wheelbase model or the long wheelbase variant and that's 200 millimeters longer. Specific changes made to this model for the 2018 model year, mainly centered around this revised front grille. Land Rover had to redesign this to allow for the insertion of the charging port needed for the new PHEV model. Uh, this bumper's been restyled too. It now features these widened vent blades. Uh, the headlight technology is new with matrix LED beams, which adapt to other road users, now standard, and piercing pixel LED and pixel laser headlamps being optional. Uh, even the clamshell bonnet's been tinkered with. It's now both physically and visually longer, giving the driver a cleaner view ahead. At the rear, the restyled bumper even more subtly integrates these two chrome trimmed rear exhaust outlets. Another lovely styling touch is the hidden until lit high mounted LED stop lamp positioned under the roof spoiler where it illuminates across the full width of the tailgate. More important though is what lies beneath the surprisingly slippery bodywork. That's essentially a one billion pound investment in aluminium technology. Now, this was the world's first SUV to boast a lightweight all aluminium monocoque body structure. Uh, and that's why this fourth generation model is up to 420 kilos lighter than the previous generation design. Uh, that's a weight saving equivalent to a full complement of passengers. And that's despite the fact that this L4 05 series model is slightly longer and wider than its predecessor. So let's take a seat inside. Uh, you'd be disappointed if you didn't have to climb up into the Range Rover. That's part of its appeal. Now, if you've tried the smaller Velar model, you might be a bit surprised that the handles don't glide out to meet your hand as they do there, but uh, the doors do feel solid and vault-like in keeping with this SUV's gentrified remit. 
Seated commandingly up front amongst the beautiful leathers, polished metal, uh, the deep pile carpet and the glossy surfacing, you find yourself in a cabin that looks as classy and cosseting as ever with its clean, elegant controls, its redesigned leather seats, we're going to get to those in a minute, and a notable absence of button clutter. Now that last observation relates to improvements brought about by the major change made to the interior of this post-2018 era model, the installation of the Touch Pro Duro Infotainment system that we first saw on the Velar, complete with its two high-definition 10-inch central touchscreens. This is Land Rover's vision of a buttonless future where most of the controls lie in menus behind toughened glass, but you still retain an important analog element courtesy of these uh, configurable rotary dials that float above the lower screen. Now these can be used to control the cabin temperature, the fan speed and seat functions, as well as the terrain response drive settings. In between these two controllers, there's a proper volume dial so you don't have to stab away at the touch screen or at a steering wheel button to change the audio output output of the superb Meridian sound system that all variants feature in various guises. Unfortunately, uh, you will need to prod, pinch or swipe or get to grips with voice control to activate anything else in this infotainment setup. Now, we still prefer the kind of separate controller between the seats that BMW and Mercedes provide, although uh, provision of that kind of feature here might lead to confusion with the rotary transmission controller that rises from the base of the centre stack on startup. That aside, the Pro Duo system is difficult to fault, and in most respects, its two screens work beautifully, offering you the ability to better configure the functions that you want to prioritize. For example, it's perfectly possible for the driver to view a navigation map on the upper display, while the passenger adjusts media settings on the one below. You simply can't do that with the single monitor that super luxury SUV segment rivals offer. We love the graphic definition and the fact that you can alter the angle of the flush fitting top screen to suit your driving position. Not so good as the way that the lower monitor is set a little too far down the centre stack and there's also the issue that both screens lack haptic feedback and they can sometimes take a bit too long to respond to some commands and the way that the whole setup can quickly become coated with messy fingerprints. Plus, rather amazingly, uh, this setup doesn't incorporate the industry common Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring systems that every rival offers. Now, there is a free Land Rover app that gives you a certain amount of this functionality, but it's nothing like as easy to access or to use. Still, there is an online media package which allows numerous content providers, uh, Deezer and TuneIn, for example, to directly stream personalized entertainment into the cabin without the need for a smartphone and you get a 4G Wi-Fi hotspot that can be used for up to eight devices. Anything this Panasonic developed Touch Pro Duo setup can't tell you will almost certainly be covered off by the instruments you view through this imposing four-spoke stitched multifunction wheel. These are virtual customizable gauges, of course. The Range Rover was one of the first cars of the industry to get a digital dash. This one is a 12.3 inch so-called interactive driver display. Now to be frank, it's not quite as intuitive as say the virtual cockpit that you'll find in a rival Audi Q7, but there are a lot of configurable options and they're controlled by shiny steering wheel switches. These allow you to view either one or two dials, a full map, or layouts that prioritise either media or driving assistance functions alongside a digital speedo. Not that you'll be looking at any of that very much if you specify your car with the now larger head-up display which projects key driving information onto the base of the windscreen. Plenty of technology then to embellish the traditional Range Rover experience, which as ever is centred around high set positioning that uh, places you imperiously above other drivers. Uh, the seats in question are heated and every way powered, of course, and they can be specified with cooling and a special hot stone massage system. Even the incorporated armrests can be warmed. Now, these chairs were completely revised for this post-2018 era model with deeper foam cushioning and a frame now so wide that the designers have had to relocate the electric seat controls onto the doors. Now, on these doors, a neat touch lies with a switch panel which includes the option to select the air suspension's lowest access height. Now this lowers the vehicle by up to 50 millimeters to help passengers get in and out. 
Less obvious changes made to this cabin in recent times uh, relate to improvements in interior storage. Opening this panel by the gear controller reveals the expected couple of cup holders, but it's not initially apparent that below these lies a deep four and a half litre stowage box incorporating a USB port. Uh, further back, there's this 7.89 litre storage box between the seats featuring a top tray with USB, HDMI, SIM and 12 volt ports. Below that is an area that can be fully refrigerated and which can hold up to four 500 mil bottles and chill them down to five degrees C. Not so good is the fact there's no overhead compartment for your sunglasses and the fact that the upper uh, lockable glove box isn't that big, especially if you specify it with this CD player. Good job that the one underneath is more capacious. Also on the plus side, the door bins have been reshaped so they can now hold larger 1.5 litre bottles. Right, let's take a seat in the rear, and that's an important area for Land Rover to get right with this car, hence the 42 millimeters of extra wheelbase length added into this fourth generation model. Even that, though, still leaves this standard body shape 140 millimeters shorter in terms of overall length than its closest rival, the Bentley Bentayga. Now, if that is an issue, then you'll be directed towards the alternative long wheelbase body style that we mentioned earlier, and that's available with the plushest trim levels, which, as we said, adds a further 200 mils to the overall length. Uh, if you go for your Range Rover in that bigger guise, then you'll be uh, pleased to find out that uh, no other super luxury SUV is larger save for the exotic Rolls-Royce Cullinan. Even in this short wheelbase model, it's easy to get comfortable once you're inside with a standard heated upholstery and a powered reclining backrest for longer journeys. Uh, there's over a meter of leg stretching room and you can extend that by a further 186 millimeters if you go for the long wheelbase body style. Now that comes complete with Land Rover's desirable and now redesigned executive class seating package. And that's also available on some standard shape models. Uh, with that package, the wider seats recline back even further to as much as 40 degrees, plus there are eight headrest settings and at the press of a button a footrest can glide out and the front passenger seat can be moved forward to maximise space. Plus, on request, you can add in hot stone massaging too. With that layout, you also now get a power deployable centre console that needn't get in the way of passengers exiting from either side of the rear of the vehicle. Here we've stuck with the standard seating layout, but it's still very nice indeed, especially if you specify seat cooling and the lovely winged headrests. Uh, the bench isn't really designed to make a center occupant very comfortable, but there'll be no complaints in terms of head and shoulder room. Uh, this standard glass panoramic roof makes this an airy feeling place to be too, and it can on request feature a gesture powered sun blind. Digital climate control dials are provided and below them there are plenty of power source ports, uh, a couple of 12 volt and 5 volt points, plus a lidded compartment beneath with a 230 volt uh, AC 180 watt socket. Another neat touch can be found on the doors which provide a panel with functionality that allows you to turn on the reading lights, uh, activate the sun blind and retract the windows on both sides with a single touch. As for storage, well, there are rather small door bins and pull-out seat pockets, uh, plus recesses in the door armrests. If you fold down the rather unnecessarily large centre fold-out armrest that's provided with this space model, you'll get twin cup holders and a lidded compartment. So let's head to the back. Now, as you probably know, providing a third row of seats really isn't the Range Rover's thing, even though it's easily lengthy enough to make a seven seat cabin feasible. Uh, being able to provide that option gives the rival Bentley Bentayga an advantage here. Still, Range Rover buyers have never seemed to want extra boot mounted chairs. Luggage space has always been a greater priority. Surprisingly, the larger body shell of this fourth generation model didn't free up any more of it. Now we're gonna to get to that in a second. First though, let's give thanks that the classic split tailgate still features here. These days, it's power operated and gesture controlled with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper. 
Once it's activated, a 909 litre luggage bay is revealed. Now that might be about 10% less than the old pre-2012 Mark III model Range Rover could provide, but it's still 125 litres more than you'll get on a Range Rover Sport, and nearly twice the size of the cargo area provided by that rival Bentley Bentayga. Or at least it is in the conventional petrol or diesel engine Range Rover. Go for this plug-in hybrid P400e model, and due to the need to accommodate a battery pack and an electric motor beneath the floor, that total capacity drops by 98 litres, thanks to the fact that the floor level is raised by 46 millimetres. Uh, the petrol electric powertrain also robs you of the option of being able to have a spare wheel here too. Uh, this is a very usable space and it's easy to access thanks to the way that you can use this provided button to drop the height of the air suspension by up to uh, 50 millimetres. You can also, by the way, also raise the ride height uh, by up to 90 millimetres to assist in the hitching up of trailers. What else? Uh, well, there are six tie down points and a 12 volt port, as well as a 230 volt AC 180 watt socket. Plus you get a recessed area on the right and there's a shallow floor compartment if you pull up this stitched leather strap. Uh, those who need more room might be disappointed by the lack of flexibility though. Uh, there's no ski hatch provided, nor is there a 40-20-40 seat back split. So if you have longer items to carry, you're gonna have to flatten part or all of the rear bench. Electronic buttons are provided for this purpose. Now you can use these to ease the angle of the backrest forward if you just want a few more inches to squeeze in that extra awkward suitcase, or they can flatten the rear seat entirely and pleasingly, they can erect it again too. Now when everything is flat, uh, 2,360 litres of space is on offer. Range Rover these days inhabits more exclusive territory than that in which you'll find ordinary large luxury SUVs and it's been priced accordingly for the various Vogue and Vogue SE models which form the starting point in the range and that's what we've got here. Uh, prices sit in the 80 to 95,000 pound bracket. Engine options with these variants begin as usual with the 3 litre TD V6 diesel plus Vogue SE buyers also get offered a 340 horsepower 3 litre V6 supercharged petrol unit 2. If neither of those two power plants suit, then a premium of around £7,000 is necessary to get yourself the choice of either the 4.4 litre SD V8 diesel or the P400e petrol electric plug-in hybrid model that we're trying here. The next and more exclusive level in the Range Rover lineup is found with the various autobiography models, but for one of those, uh, you'll probably be spending anywhere between 100 and 120,000 pounds. Now it's these variants that you'll need if we want the option of the long wheelbase body style, and that adds 7,200 pounds to the asking price, and it can't be ordered with the base TDV6 diesel engine. Now that shouldn't really be an issue because a Range Rover autobiography buyer will almost certainly be wanting one of the more powerful units anyway, uh, perhaps the SDV8 diesel or the P400e hybrid units carried over from the Vogue models, or if you really don't care about running costs, well, maybe even the five litre V8 petrol supercharged unit with 525 horsepower. The final most desirable tier of Range Rover ownership is found with the various SV autobiography derivatives and they feature unique engineering from Land Rover's special vehicle operations team. Now these are usually sold with the long wheelbase body style and they tend to sell in the 170 to 180,000 pound bracket with either the SD V8 diesel, the P400e plug-in hybrid or that 5 litre V8 petrol supercharged unit which at that level gets a software tweak to boost its power up to 565 horsepower. The latter engine is one used for the most enthusiast orientated model, the SV Autobiography Dynamic, which uses the short wheelbase body style and costs around 142,000 pounds. Enough on the lineup, where does this kind of pricing leave this car in terms of its market positioning? Well, obviously it's above what you'd pay for large luxury SUVs like Addis Q7 and the Mercedes GLS, which mainly sell in the 60 to 80,000 pound bracket, but then Land Rover has its Range Rover Sport to target cars like those. Uh, the Range Rover and the Range Rover Sport model lines are difficult to directly compare because engine and specs are slightly different in each case, but 
In rough terms, uh, you'd need to think of an equivalently powered and trimmed version of a full fat Range Rover costing around 15 to 20,000 pounds more than its sports showroom stablemate. Now that is because, as referenced at the beginning, this top Range Rover model now inhabits more exclusive super luxury SUV territory. And in that segment, there's really nothing quite like what's on offer here. Although particular competitor models might in certain instances uh, attract interest against particular Range Rover derivatives. So, for example, a £100,000 Porsche Cayenne Turbo could be of interest to you if you were looking at a £110,000 Range Rover Autobiography 5 litre V8 and either the £145,000 Mercedes AMG G63 or the £160,000 Lamborghini Urus might tempt you if you'd previously been looking at the £142,000 Range Rover SV Autobiography Dynamic 5 litre V8 model we were just talking about. Uh, if you are fortunate enough to be looking towards the very summit of the Range Rover lineup at one of the plutocratic long wheel based uh, SV autobiography models then the most obvious market alternative is a well specified version of Bentley's Bentayga and that prices in its standard form between £136,000 and £163,000. Forget the Rolls-Royce Cullinan SUV though as a direct alternative you could have two of these for the price of one of those. Now here we've chosen to test the P400E plug-in hybrid version of this Range Rover and if that's where your interest lies then it's even harder to find really direct rivals. Uh, the base Vogue P400E model we've chosen to test here, that'll probably cost you just under £90,000 once you've added in a few well-chosen extras. Uh, that's just over £20,000 more than large segment plug-in hybrid SUVs like Audi's Q7 e-tron, uh, Porsche's Cayenne e-hybrid and Volvo's XC90 T8 twin engine but as we said earlier cars like those aren't really from the same class of this one and they're rather more directly targeted by the P400e plug-in hybrid version of the Range Rover Sport and that price is from just over £70,000. Again you have to turn to the Bentley Bentayga for a true arrival now that car can be ordered with plug-in hybrid tech but at prices that uh, would only really make sense if you were considering a P400e Range Rover in top SV autobiography trim. Enough. Well done to you if you've actually gone through the comparison process to arrive at a properly considered decision for Range Rover ownership. The truth is though that the vast majority of likely buyers of this car won't have bothered with any of that. They'll simply have opted for another Range Rover because that's what they've always had and or because it's still recognised by many as the very best super luxury SUV that it's possible to buy. Rolls-Royce tell us that nearly all their owners also seem to have a Range Rover in their garage. Well, at least they did before the Cullinan was launched anyway. And that probably says it all. So let's say you've decided on a Range Rover. Exactly what's included as standard across the lineup? And what are the options open to you if, as is likely, you'll want to spend plenty more in creating a very personal version of your chosen variant? Well, let's see. Now here, as we mentioned earlier, we've chosen to test the entry-level Vogue variant, but as you'd have a right to expect for the money being asked, it's still very well specified indeed, as well as the usual staple Range Rover features, unrivaled all-wheel drive engineering, an eight-speed automatic gearbox, air suspension and so on. There's plenty else now included that used to be optional on base versions of this car or simply wasn't available at all. So you can tick off matrix LED headlights, 20-inch 12-spoke wheels, a powered gesture-controlled tailgate, power-folding auto-dimming exterior mirrors, laminated front and rear side glass, a fixed panoramic glass roof and keyless entry. You'll get a temporary spare wheel and a tracking system these days too. Inside, uh, there's a 12.3-inch interactive drive display to replace the conventional instruments, plus Windsor leather upholstery for seats that are heated and 20-way power adjustable up front, and which feature power reclining at the back. Uh, there's also three-zone climate control, a heated steering wheel, and a heated windscreen, along with more usual executive niceties like auto headlamps and wipers, uh, headlamp washers, and cruise control with a speed limiter. Infotainment, that's marshalled by the two high-definition 
10 inch center dash touchscreens of the latest Touch Pro Duo system, and that includes a 380 watt Meridian sound package, Jaguar Land Rover's latest navigation pro setup, a DAB tuner, Bluetooth, voice control, and even a digital TV. A CD DVD player is a no cost option. Only Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring is missing. That's odd, but there are various remote features that you can operate via your smartphone, plus a selection of apps and the option to create in the car a 4G Wi Fi hotspot. If you want an even more luxurious Range Rover, but you still want to keep your total spend below six figures, might be worth finding the extra £6,600 Land Rover asks to upgrade yourself into Vogue SE spec. That extra cash gets you larger 21-inch, seven split-spoke silver-finished wheels, soft door closing, uh, some extra camera-driven safety kit we'll cover off in a minute, and an improved version of the Terrain Response System, that's Terrain Response 2, that for off-road has a useful set-and-forget auto feature. Inside, Vogue SE models feature softer semi-aniline leather upholstery, which is cooled up front and both heated and cooled in the rear. Plus there's an upgraded 825 watt surround sound version of the Meridian audio system, a 360 degree parking aid and configurable ambient lighting. Now you wouldn't think that that would leave very much for the supposedly much plusher autobiography models to add, but of course that you'd be wrong. Uh, perhaps the key addition here is the executive class rear seating package with a power deployable rear center console and functionality that can recline the rear seat back by up to 40 degrees while simultaneously pushing the front passenger seat forward if you really want to stretch out while the chauffeur eases you home after a long day in the boardroom. Uh, with long wheelbase variants, the paparazzi can be blocked out by rear privacy glass and rear sun blinds. Plus, with that length and body style, you also get a pair of 10-inch rear seat entertainment touchscreens, a CD DVD player, and a solar attenuating windscreen. Should you have to drive yourself in any autobiography spec Range Rover model, you'll be pleased to find that up front at this level in the lineup, the seats are 24-way power adjustable and they include a hot stone massaging function. Plus, the ambiance is embellished with satin straight worn-up veneer, suede cloth headlining, premium carpet mats, uh, illuminated door sill tread plates, a sliding version of the panoramic glass roof, and four-zone climate control with specific rear seat functionality. Uh, there's also a surround view camera setup and a park assist system, which will automatically steer you into spaces. Uh, moving outside, the headlights get an upgrade at this level to pixel LED status, and that sees triple the number of LEDs included as part of beams that can bend with the road ahead. Uh, autobiography models also get LED front fog lamps, a light silver diamond turned finish for the 21 inch wheels, and if you want it, a contrast colored roof. That leaves only flagship SV autobiography trim. Uh, now these variants feature Land Rover's ultimate headlamp technology, the Pixel Laser High Beam option that gives a precise and constant light more than 500 meters ahead of the vehicle thanks to 144 LEDs and four laser diodes. Inside, the seats have sumptuous quilted leather, there's a perforated leather headlining, wood veneered rear fold-out tables, mohair carpet mats, refrigerated compartments front and rear, a uh, veneered power deployable load space floor, knurled effect pedals, and the very best sound system that audio specialists Meridian have ever produced, a thumping 1700 watt signature setup. Various exterior trim embellishments advertise the exclusive SV autobiography trim status, including gloss black brake calipers. Uh, on the short wheelbase SV autobiography dynamic model, those calipers are trimmed in red and they peep through the spokes of large 22 inch five split spoke dark gray contrast wheels. So having covered the standard spec items that come with the various trim levels in the lineup, let's now go on to look at the extra cost options. Now most of the items that feature on the plusher trim levels can be added into lesser variants when you spend more. Uh, just pick out the items that you like the sound of from the ones we've mentioned and just ask your dealer about them. There are various extra cost packs too, and they're mainly for the two Vogue spec models. Now these packs add in some of the luxury that you get at autobiography level. So a cold climate pack uh, gives you four zone climate control and a remote park heat system with a timer. 
a hot climate pack, packages the four zone climate control up with a solar attenuating windscreen and a front refrigerated compartment. A vision assist pack, that'll give you a head up display, a surround view camera system, front fog lights too, and if your car doesn't already have it, configurable ambient interior lighting. Now, if you're interested in technology, an upgrade to the Pixel LED or Pixel Laser LED headlights might grab your attention. Uh, you'll probably also want the head-up display too, and maybe also the Park Assist system, which will automatically steer you into spaces. Uh, for the P400E Hybrid and the V8 Supercharged Petrol models, you can specify an active rear locking differential to optimize tarmac cornering traction and stability. Talking of the P400E, bear in mind that the only charging cable that's supplied as standard is a 10 amp one. You'll probably also want the public charging cable that's compatible with AC wall boxes and the multifunction cable that's for use at higher power 32 amp commercial charging locations. Uh, whatever engine you've chosen for your Range Rover, remember that if it comes with the base Vogue trim level that we're trying here, uh, you'll have to pay extra for the Terrain Response 2 and the All Surface Progress Control Systems, which uh, make the deployment of this car's four-wheel drive system more intuitive over rough ground. Uh, when it comes to high-tech stuff for the inside, the advanced nano cabin air ionization system might be of interest. This uses nano-sized charged water particles to help remove harmful substances from the interior atmosphere while cleansing the air and eliminating allergens, viruses, bacteria, and odors. A more overt way of spending any extra cash would be to specify the entertainment pack though, and that gives you a couple of eight inch rear seat screens. Plus, if your car doesn't have it, the 825 watt Meridian surround sound system. Vogue SE and autobiography customers will alternatively be able to specify the signature entertainment pack and that includes a couple of 10 inch rear seat screens plus the 1700 watt Meridian signature sound system. Uh, you'll want to get the look of this Range Rover exactly to your taste, so let's cover that next. Uh, metallic paint is standard, like for example the Byron Blue finish we have here, but you could spend a little more on a premium metallic finish or a lot more on one of the SVO Ultra Metallic or SVO Special Effect paint shades. Uh, SV Autobiography buyers can spend 10 to 15,000 pounds more on even more exclusive duotone paint palette shades. Uh, buyers are of the two Vogue trim levels can pay extra for a black or silver finished contrast roof too. For an all-round meaner look, consider the shadow exterior pack or the black exterior pack, and they add in darker trimming to various exterior features. Uh, as you'd expect, there's a range of alloy wheel styles with rims varying in size from 19 to 22 inches. We have the seven split spoke silver finished 21 inch rims fitted here, and you can get chromed mirror covers, bright side tubes, and carbon fiber trim from the engine cover. Uh, there's also a fearsomely expensive SV design pack. Inside there are various different optional color and trim combinations plus you select from a range of different polished veneers and there's a choice of luxury headliners. Uh, bright metal pedals are an option as are aluminium or red colored gear shift pedals, an umbrella holder and luxury carpet mats too. At the top of the range SV autobiography model buyers can specify ultimate quilted Poltona Frau leather upholstery. With the two Vogue trim levels you can add in a wood trimmed steering wheel, illuminated tread plates, front seat massaging with extra powered assistance uh, plus rear seat cooling. If you can stretch to at least Vogue SE trim then you'll have the option of adding in the executive class rear seating package that we were referencing earlier. What else? Well, uh, gesture control technology has made it into the Range Rover, although only for activation of the panoramic roof's powered sunblind. For outdoorsy types, well, the leather tailgate vent seat trim might appeal if you're going to be regularly sitting on the lower part of the retracted tailgate and watching sporting events, for example. Folk of that kind might also appreciate what is arguably our favorite option across the range, uh, the activity key, which you wear like a watch and you can open or lock the car just by presenting the fob to the tailgate badge. Now, that'll be ideal for those who are using this car for various outdoor pursuits. 
On to practicalities. Now there's more to pay if you want a full size spare wheel rather than the temporary one. And uh, many owners will want the electrically deployable tow bar to be fitted, in which case your dealer will also want to tell you about the advanced tow assist technology that you can have, uh, which will help when you're hitched up and trying to park a trailer. Now with this setup, images from the uh, rear facing camera are relayed to the central touch screen and the driver can maneuver using the Terrain Response 2 system's rotary controller. Uh, now the advanced tow assist system will then autonomously steer the trailer into place. All the driver has to do is to operate the accelerator and brake pedals. Uh, an optional towing pack will bundle together the uh, electrically deployable tow bar and that advanced tow assist system and that'll also throw in a full size spare wheel and the activity key that we mentioned earlier. Uh, if you do have a tow bar fitted then you'll also be able to specify a cycle carrier and that can take up to four bikes. As for other practical extra cost stuff, well, fixed and deployable side steps are available, along with mud flaps, roof rails and crossbars, a ski bag and a roof box, plus roof carriers for things like skis, bikes, snowboards and kayaks. Load space rails and a power deployable load space floor for the cargo bay would be useful, as would a load space liner tray, a load space reversible carpet mat, a load retention net, a collapsible luggage carrier, a luggage box, a luggage divider, a luggage partition and a load space Space security box. We also like the cooler warmer box that fits into the rear seat armrest, the wireless phone charging cup holder, the optional domestic plug sockets and the unique wade sensing feature that provides depth information when you're driving through water. On to safety, uh, and we'll start with the standard features. Land Rover's got with the program in recent years and has added an autonomous emergency braking system into all Range Rover models. Now, this is one of those setups uh, which scans the road ahead, looking for potential accident hazards as you drive. Uh, if one's detected, then you'll be warned. If you don't respond, or well, perhaps you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied, uh, and that's to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Lane departure warning also comes as standard as does an in control protect feature in the infotainment system and that will automatically alert the emergency services as to your exact location if the airbags go off. Other standard safety features may be more familiar to you. Things like Isofix child seat fastenings, a uh, pedestrian friendly bonnet, tyre pressure monitoring, uh, brake lights that flash in an emergency stop and a whole bouncy castle quota of airbags. Uh, more specifically, as well as airbags for both front seat occupants, you get to side, curtain and thorax airbags too. Now hopefully you'll never need any of that, but to try to ensure that the worst never happens, there's a whole raft of electronic assistance features. So stand by for the acronyms. On road, as well as the usual anti-lock brakes with EB a emergency brake assist these include dsc dynamic stability control etc electronic traction control edc engine drag torque control cbc corner brake control uh, rsc roll stability control and if you need it tsa trailer stability assist off-road, you're more likely to use HAS, Hill Start Assist to get you up steep slopes, GRC, Gradient Release Control to ease you over the summit, and HDC, Hill Descent Control to help you get down the other side. Want to go further? Well, of course, that's possible if you have more to spend. Optional on this base Vogue model, but standard on all the other variants, is a drive pack and a park pack that together include a range of key features. Uh, drive pack stuff includes traffic sign recognition. Now that pictures road signs as you pass them and then displays them for you on the dash. Uh, an adaptive speed limiter, which notes speed signs that you pass. And if it's set, it won't let you exceed that speed. A driver condition monitor, which checks out your responses as you drive and will flash up warnings to stop if it detects drowsiness. And a blind spot monitor, which works on the move uh, to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another vehicle. Uh, park pack stuff, meanwhile, includes a rear exit monitor. Now that warns passengers of approaching traffic when you're getting out of the vehicle. And a rear traffic monitor, and that warns you of approaching traffic when you're reversing out of a parking space. 
If you want more, then from autobiography trim upwards, you get adaptive cruise control with Q Assist. And that's a setup that not only automatically keeps you a safe distance behind traffic on the highway, but can also uh, basically drive for you in stop start urban traffic. Plus also lane keep assist, which is able to gently steer you back into lane if you drift out of it. Uh, also there's blind spot assist, and that's able to steer you back into lane if you move out to overtake when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. Now, if you like the sound of these three systems, but you're buying into the lineup at one of the two Vogue trim levels, then you can add them into your car by paying extra for the optional Drive Pro pack. Celebrity Range Rover owners like the British Royal Family, uh, Bruce Springsteen, Jack Nicholson, Keira Knightley and Madonna may not worry too much about running costs, but an increasing number of Range Rover owners do. After all, it's a little hard to tell your employees to turn off their screensavers at night if you're driving a hulking great super luxury SUV that can't even average 30 miles per gallon on a good day. EEC directives will also be punitive to Land Rover's business if the company doesn't make its cars a bit more planet friendly. Hence the huge investment in lightweight aluminium technology that's brought us the fourth generation version of this car. The extra efficiency of this car isn't only down to aluminium, mind you. There's the surprisingly slippery 0.34 CD drag coefficient, the lightweight Brembo front brake calipers, uh, the active front grille shutter, the aerodynamic underfloor panelling, the electric power steering, and the start-stop system, which cuts the engine when you don't need it, when you're stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Plus, uh, the driving mode system provides a frugally orientated eco setting. Not that you should get your hopes up too high in this regard. Now, this might be the most economical Range Rover lineup ever made, but it still won't get you installed on the Greenpeace Christmas card list if you buy one. Uh, add on a few options, and even an entry level model could easily end up weighing over two and a half tons. And that makes the 40.9 miles per gallon combined cycle fuel figure and the 182 grams per kilometer CO2 return boasted by the entry level TDV6 diesel engine all the more impressive. Thanks to the four 420 kilo weight saving provided by the aluminium structure, that V6 variant is able to provide exactly the same performance as the old V8 diesel and the old uh, pre-2012 third generation Range Rover lineup, yet return running cost figures that are 20% improved. If you want to do better than that, you'll need the powertrain option that we've chosen to try today, the P400E petrol electric plug-in hybrid. Now this makes a two litre, 300 horsepower Ingenium four cylinder petrol engine with an 85 kilowatt electric motor powered by a 13.1 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery. It's a sophisticated combination that produces an eye-catching set of figures, 101 MPG on the combined cycle, 73 grams per kilometer of CO2, and those are based on the WLTP test. That that all electric driving range is provided if you select the EV driving mode, which locks the vehicle down into milk float mobility. Uh, the stats in question are, as with most plug in hybrids, straight out of fairyland. In our time with this car, we've probably averaged around 25 miles per gallon and sometimes struggled to ease the all electric range much beyond double figures, even with quite conservative driving. The key thing, though, is that the government believes them, hence a set of plug in hybrid incentive figures that for some buyers will make compatible compelling reading. For a start, your first year of vehicle excise duty, what used to be called road tax, will be just £15 compared to £1,200 for the closest performing diesel Range Rover. More importantly, there's a big potential monthly benefiting kind tax saving, given that this car sits in the 16% bracket as opposed to the 37% bracket for the next cleanest TDV6 diesel model. True, you don't get the government funded PHEV grant towards initial purchase that on cheaper plugs subsidizes you to the tune of £2,500. That only applies to vehicles costing less than £60,000. But a Range Rover P400e will qualify for complete exemption from the £11.50 per day London congestion charge. You can set its charging system to replenish itself at off-peak electricity rates too, either via the Centre Dash Touch Pro Duo screen or using a provided smartphone app. 
you plug in by pulling back a rather cheap feeling plastic flap built into the right hand side of the radiator grill. Uh, charging takes seven and a half hours from an ordinary 10 amp domestic plug via the provided home charging lead. Uh, so that's fine for usual overnight plugging in. You also want to ask your dealer for the different multifunction cable, which is for use at high power 32 amp commercial locations and super -re equipped homes. This can reduce the charge time down to two hours and 45 minutes. And the same charging performance can be achieved by using a third public charging cable, which is compatible with AC wall boxes uh, that you'll find at some service stations and which some people will have at home or at work. Now that's quite a regime to adjust to and it'll only really make sense as an ownership proposition if the benefiting kind tax savings make a huge difference to you and or you regularly use your Range Rover for urban motoring. For that the uh, P400e model's drive system provides a save mode so you can save battery charge until you can make the most of it in town. On the move an active graphical display on the dash tells you at any given time what's being powered by or replenished by what. The the digital instrument display also features a selectable hybrid dial that you can use to keep the provided needle in eco or charge zones while keeping an eye on the remaining battery charge. A clever predictive energy optimization setup works when a destination is added into the navigation system, analyzing factors such as traffic flow, road gradient, and whether the route is urban or rural before programming the PHEV system to function in the most efficient way. For those who regularly travel longer distances or who simply can't be bothered with all of this, much of the same money required for the P400e Range Rover uh, would also get you the popular conventional SD V8 diesel. Now here you're looking at a combined cycle fuel reading of 33.6 mpg and a CO2 return of 219 grams per kilometer. Otherwise your only option lies with conventional petrol power. There's a minority interest 3 litre V6 supercharged variant which manages 26.4 mpg and 248 grams per kilometer. Or there's the full fat 5 litre supercharged V8, which really will help you to maximize your Tiger tokens, uh, delivering 22.1 mpg and chugging up 294 grams per kilometer of CO2. What else? Well, we mentioned benefiting kind company car tax earlier. That really will hit you hard with conventional versions of this Range Rover. Even the base diesel TDV6 is rated a full six groups higher than a comparably priced boardroom level luxury saloon like, say, a Mercedes S350D. But of course, the biggest running cost issue when it comes to any expensive luxury car is depreciation. Over three years and 36,000 miles, experts predict that the base TDV6 diesel with base Vogue trim will retain 48% of its value, although bear in mind that higher spec levels will affect this figure quite a lot. A TDV6 with a plush autobiography trim would realize just 30% of its original value at the end of the same period. Insurance groupings, meanwhile, range between 45E and 47E for the TDV6, between 48E and 50E for the SDV8. Uh, for this P400E, as for the V8 supercharged petrol model, you're looking at a top of the shop Group 50E rating. So that only leaves wider questions of eco-friendliness, things in other words that you can use to justify your purchase to any green bearded folk that you might meet down the pub. Now knowing that half of the aluminium used in the bodywork is recyclable but useful and because the body shell is mainly riveted and bonded rather than welded, far less energy is used in its production. Even the leather trim is produced using a low carbon process. Then there's the fact that a car as durable and desirable as this Range Rover is likely still to be on the road long after more overtly eco-conscious cars have been scrapped. It's all enough to give you a cosy green glow. Maybe. From princes to politicians, from rock gods to rock climbers, from footballers to farmers, the Range Rover has always appealed to a more diverse group of customers than any other car. As you expect it would, this is after all far more than just the world's most recognisable super luxury SUV. It pioneered the concept of creating four vehicles within one, an executive luxury saloon, a weekend leisure vehicle, a high performance long distance private jet and a working cross country conveyance. 
Of course, such perfection doesn't come without a price in origin or in ownership or without compromise in poorer handling, for example, against, say, a super saloon and in tighter rear cabin space against, say, a luxury limousine. Well, perhaps that's why you've never previously considered one of these. Maybe you've never driven this fourth generation Range Rover model. Well, if so, consider this if you happen to have a six-figure sum to spend on a luxury vehicle. Sophisticated aluminium underpinnings have enabled the creation here of a car that's now sharper to drive, ravishing in the rear, and more efficient than you might expect. In short, it might well change your perception of Range Rover motoring. Especially in this much improved post 2018 era form. In this guise, the Range Rover finally has a cabin with technology befitting its exalted price tag, being better connected, safer, and even more luxurious. The main change here, though, has been the introduction of the optional plug in hybrid powertrain that we've been trying here. Now, it won't work for everyone, but the right kind of buyer will find the running cost savings that come with this engine to be utterly compelling. Much has changed then, but thank goodness at the same time, nothing here is really different. Drive this car through a river, drive it to the opera. It's as happy either way. It's beautifully built, it's gorgeously finished, and with the right engine, it's astonishingly quick. True, this Range Rover is never quite gonna be all things to all people, but it has perhaps moved as close to fulfilling that remit as any modern car is ever likely to get. Makes you proud to be British, doesn't it? <laughs>